Hello everyone, my name is Katherine Kuntz. I am the supervisor of the Richardson Sloan Special Collection Center of the Davenport Public Library. Today, as a part of Preservation Week, I will be presenting on preserving family heirlooms, books, papers, and photographs. We'll be covering what is preservation, the basic care and te techniques that we can take to preserve our family artifacts, as well as some things to know about the materials themselves. So what causes damage to them, those types of things. So we'll explore that more in our presentation today. Many of us have heard the words preservation, conservation, and restoration in many different contexts. But what does it mean when applied to books, papers, and photographs? Since the 1980s, the library and archival communities have used Preservation as an umbrella term for activities that reduce or prevent damage to extend the life expectancy of collections, whereas conservation refers more specifically to the physical treatment of an individually damaged item. Preventative conservation is another term that is used to describe broad collections care activities that supports the longevity of the artifacts and records, such as environmental mon monitoring. The term restoration, on the other hand, is mostly used in context with museum objects or motion picture films. It generally refers to the process of returning an object to its original state, or what is thought to have been its original state. So for example, we preserve something by putting it in a box. We conserve something by mending it, such as you mend a spine of a book. And if you restore something, that's typically referred to as a situation with an art object, um, restoring a, a painting by a famous artist. Um, but all these definitions have come from AIC, or the American Institute for Conservation, of historic and artistic works. On the next slide, we'll be learning more about why preservation is so important. Libraries, archives, museums, and other cultural institutions house collections of historical and cultural significance. The treasures and reminiscences of individuals, families, and communities are invaluable to and essential to preserving a record of personal, local, and national history. This type of history we are referring to is not just what we learned in the classroom, but it is an encompassing topic that includes all subjects. Thus, the importance of safekeeping these materials will ensure that future generations will be able to learn from them. As natural and man-made disasters of recent years have taught us, these resources are in jeopardy should disaster strike. Personal, family, and community Community collections are equally at risk. Preservation of historical and cultural materials at all levels is essential for recording and studying human history. It starts with its creators and then the initial people who keep the materials, so that means us. In around 2005, the first comprehensive national survey of the condition and preservation needs of the nation's collections reported that U.S. institutions hold more than 4.8 billion items. Libraries alone hold at least 3, million, 3 billion items, so that's 63% of the whole. Some 630 million items in collecting institutions require immediate attention and care. That's why preservation is so important, and that's why each year, all six, the Association the Library Collections and Technical Services promotes Preservation Week. Preservation Week is for everyone, for the public, for librarians and archivists, for museum folks who work in their institutions. It's to educate people on how to care for their materials. Now you may be wondering what items should be preserved. These materials on this list are simply a brief, brief listing of materials that libraries and archives collect, preserve, and accept as donations. This list should just help you consider what items may be beneficial for preservation. 
and what you might consider for those. Um, try and think of materials that may have historical significance, especially unpublished or one of the kind materials. Records and materials documenting an individual's experiences are important in creating a comprehensive understanding of history and culture. So just through the list, abstracts of titles that refers to a specific property that might have photographs, it might have letters, it might have deeds of transfer of the property, um, it might have architectural plans that go along with a house. Um, this is really important when considering buying an older home or if you own an old home and you have abstracts um, or when you're building your house and you're creating that history. Your house might be on the historic registry someday. Architectural drawings, artifacts, audio and video recordings. So if you have done uh, oral history with your grandmother asking about genealogy or about her early life as an immigrant, um, those things should be saved and preserved. Diaries and journals, ephemera, which might be unfamiliar to some. Um, so ephemeral materials are usually printed documents created for a specific limited purpose and generally designed to be discarded after use. So some examples of ephemera include advertisements, tickets, brochures, and receipts. A repository may collect ephemera as examples or specimens. An individual often collects ephemera as mementos or souvenirs because of their association with some person, event, or subject. Personal collections of ephemera are often kept in scrapbooks, so um, little book cards or prayer cards, um, postcards, cutouts, those types of things um, are typically found in scrapbooks, and they are ephemera. Uh, genealogical information, research collections compiled, compiled by an individual or a group, letters, maps, manuscripts, memoirs and reminiscences, um, minutes and reports if you have an organization or you're a part of a society or association or a group, photo albums and photographs, printed materials, professional and business papers, recipes, scrapbooks, and speeches. Manuscripts can also include plays that people have written um, and also manuscripts in the sense of um, book manuscripts as well. Um, so those are just a few things that you can consider in preserving. All materials have naturally occurring elements that may speed up the decomposition of an item. These are called inherent vices. They can be found in the materials that make up papers and the materials that are used in bound volumes and the structures that make that they are formed into. We can mitigate this breakdown by preservation and conservation measures. I'll be going through this list of support materials and um, things that make up a written document. Um, as well as the structures that make them up, like the bindings and reproduction methods. Um, so for starters, papers. Um, most papers produced from the mid-19th century to present become brittle in about 25 to 50 years. This is due to a process that was created in the 1840s. Um, it, it was developed to use ground wood pulp paper Ground wood pulp paper contains more lignin, a naturally occurring organic compound, than is found in fibers of flax or hemp. Lignin is not only acidic, causing the paper to become weak and brittle, but upon exposure to light, it oxidizes, causing the paper to darken. The term, um, so when we look at materials such as newspapers, we can see that they are made of acidic materials because they are that yellowish um, kind of antique looking um, color, um, sometimes even a dark brown, and they are very fragile to touch. Um, even if you're being very careful, they may flake and fall apart in your hands. Um, another support that 
has inherent ciphers is parchment. Um, parchment is typically referring to any skin that has been prepared for writing, and sometimes to specifically um, refer to sheepskin. Vellum, on the other hand, refers only to calf skin. Um, within these materials, if custom is present, it will cause the parchment to turn a gray color. Um, parchment is also subject to a photochemical reaction, the result of a light exposure, in which hydrogen peroxide forms, causing the parchment to break down and become brittle and fragile, um, thus gelatinized. If the gelatinized parchment is brought into contact with water, it disintegrates into loose flakes. Um, so we really want to avoid that. Um, another really common thing that folks may have seen is, is um, leather, and they ha it has a um, inherent vice that causes red rot. This is a process in which the leather fibers break down and turn into a red powder. In this process, sulfur dioxide is absorbed from the atmosphere and converted into sulfuric acid through oxidation. The sulfuric acid catalyzes acid hydrolysis and breaks down the molecular chain of the collagen and weakens the leather. Some vegetable tannins used during the tanning process seems to cause the leather to decay more quickly. Finally, marble decorations applied to book bindings in the 17th and 18th centuries can leave black corroded spots on the bindings or damage the grain of the leather. So red rot um, can be mitigated. It cannot be treated. Um, so don't try and put oils onto the red rot. It it won't it won't help it. Um, but you can wrap it in in cloth or paper and keep it separate from other materials. Um, and just um, try and keep it in an environmentally cool place with low hum humidity. Um, another um, item that has inherent vices it is, is adhesives. Adhesives can be natural such as wheat starch paste or synthetic polyvinyl acetate. Um, starch adhesives share common properties with cellulose, while synthetic adhesives are very similar to plastics. Animal glues traditionally used in book bindings can break down over time and become discolored, dark, and brittle. They cause staining or simply crumble and fail. Synthetic adhesives react physically with water to produce swelling and chemically to produce structural weakness and acidic byproducts. In addition, evaporation of components within adhesives can cause them to become brittle. Many adhesives used in collections in the past years have not lasted very well. Damage from often damage often includes discoloration, staining, and even failure of the adhesive. This is really common with rubber cement and self-adhesive tape. While archival pressure-sensitive tapes have uh, do appear to be more stable um, than traditional pressure-sensitive tapes, um, but they still have the same issues um, of failing. Natural adhesives, such as wheat or rice starch paste, are relatively stable and often used in book and paper conservation. Um, so don't use um, glue or tape to fix your book. Um, if, if you don't care about the book, you can test it out um, for yourself. But if it's a heirloom that you wanna preserve, um, contact a conservator or um, just box it and keep it stable. Um, in its condition that it is in. Um, don't put tape or glue on it. Um, then um, on to colorants. So colorants come in various types. Um, they are encountered in many different materials in, the, in your collection. Um, there's two types of categories for colorants, pigments and dyes. Both are colored substances that are dissolved in some sort of liquid. Um, this liquid is called a vehicle. The pigment is, pigments are not soluble in a vehicle, but they are rather dispersed or suspended in it. 
Dyes, on the other hand, are soluble in the vehicle, and the colors and colors and objects by being absorbed into it, and often with the assistance of another color, another chemical called a mordant. mordant. Science of colorants is quite complex. Some colors, in some cases, colorants can be either pigments or dye, depending on the vehicle used. Um, many pigments made from soluble dyes are chemically bonding, chemically bonding to the dyes with met metallic salts. This is called a lake. Um, pigments and dyes are customarily classified according to their origins, such as organic, inorganic, and natural and synthetic. So the history of pigments, um, they are made from many minerals and they were first used 60,000 years ago. Natural organic pigments made from um, plant extracts and animal materials have been used since antiqu antiquity for many purposes, including cosmetic and textile dyeing. The first synthetic pigments were inorganic. Um, after 1800, the technology had developed sufficiently to produce these pigments on large scales. In 1856, the first synthetic organic dye, mauve, was developed from aniline, a chemical extracted from coal tar. So types of deterioration that affects colorants. Um, the primary form of colorant deterioration is fading. Although some historical pigments also deteriorate upon contact with other substances such as heat, acidic or alkali materials or chemicals, some inorganic pigments of metallic origin may cause oxidation and acidic deterioration similar to that caused by iron gall inks. Fading is a chemical change in which ultraviolet light reacts with the colorant and or triggers a reaction with oxygen or moisture, causing the colorant to change to a colorless or less colored compound. Natural inorganic pigments are very stable due to the difficulty in manufacturing. They have been replaced in modern times with synthetic or inorganic colors, many of which are still quite permanent. Natural organic pigments are very unstable and subject to light fading. Early synthetic organic colorants, aniline based, are quite brilliant, but they are unstable. Um, advances in organic chemistry have resulted in um, synthetic pigments that may, um, may be subject to bleeding. Also, if the ink was poorly manufactured, excess oils may cause staining. There's laser jet ink printing. These are also introduced on a large scale in the 1980s and have now be become ubiquitous. Laser printing uses carbon inks and involves the same process of electrostatic copying discussed later in the session section. Um, Black and white laser printing is quite stable. Um, so we have all kind of um, seen this. Um, we we mostly all use uh, laser jet or inkjet printing now. Um, they're not very light fast and they're often wa water soluble. Um, so then going on to um, the ink and pencil um, in hair and vices. Ink is essentially a liquid in which many types of possible pigments and dyes are suspended. Pencils are made from graphite, a form of carbon. Um, in paper-based collections, ink is encountered not just within a document, um, but also in printed items and artworks, pencils are generally encountered in handwritten um, documents or drawings. Inks for writing and drawing were probably first made around 2500 BC in Egypt and China. These were made from carbon suspended in water or plant uh, vegetable gum, 
hardened sap. Um, through the centuries, many other inks were developed using berries, plants, and minerals to provide colorants. Um, then there was a, a variety of inks that were developed um, after that. Some of these varieties um, may be prone to fading color changes and smearings. Um, pencils are a stable medium. The process used to make the modern uh, pencil was developed in, and patented in France in 1795. Henry, Henry Prokofsky's The Pencil provides a history of the development of the pencil, and those caring for collections should also be aware of the of a of copying pencils these were developed in the late 1870s for the use of letterpress copying process markings made with copying pencils may be mistaken for those made with graphite pencils but in fact the pe copying pencils contain not just graphite but aniline dyes that are water and alcohol soluble um, and you can tell this by um, if you get a graphite looking substance wet, it will turn purple and it will spread and dye surrounding areas. So you do not want to get water onto those markings. So some deteriorations of ink, um, carbon-based inks. Um, these are some of the earliest types of writing inks. Good quality early carbon inks do not discolor with age, but poor quality does um, turn brown over time and they both can smudge with high humidity. Um, iron gall ink, this was a predominant type of writing ink for many centuries. It was used as early as the fifth century and was the most common um, type of ink in the 12th century and well into the 20th. Um, iron gall is made from mixing tannic acid with iron salt, both highly acidic within the ink leading to acid hydrolysis of the paper and oxidation of excess iron compounds present in the ink um, make it very damaging to the support, usually paper. In extreme cases, ink actually eats through the support. Um, colored inks can be made from uh, pigments and soluble dyes, um, and these can be light resistant pigments, um, the, these inks can be made from light resistant pigments, which are better quality inks made from soluble dyes, are not light proof and may be water soluble as well. And those can be found in the um, ink tip markers. Traditional printing inks um, often use uh, often use an intaglio or engraved prints or lithographs differ from writing inks because they are oil based. So they are a little bit more greasy and gelatinous, allowing them to adhere better to the printing surfaces and perform well. Um, but these may fade over time, but they are quite stable. And they're also subject to bleeding. Um, we kind of covered the laser and ancient printings. Um, they are pretty stable, uh, modern, types of printing. And then we're going into bindings. Um, so the book, the basic form of the book has not changed fundamentally over the centuries, but changes in the materials and methods used in book binding have sometimes compromised the quality of the resulting book structures. Um, book structures in their earliest form were a roll form made from papyrus as, ve as vellum and papyrus more flexible than papyrus began to be more commonly used. The practice of folding the sheets and fastening them together began gradually. The process of binding that is still used today was developed. Individually folded signatures were sewn through the fold, and then the signatures were attached to each other by sewing them onto a cord at placed at the at right angles. To the folded signatures. These cords were usually made of cord, hemp cord or linen tape, not actual adhes adhesive tapes. Um, and they were laced through the boards. 
cover and these were covered with protective materials such as paper, um, parchment, leather, and book cloth. Boards were added to protect the, the pages. Ideally, uh, bindings should be strong and flexible so that the book opens completely and the pages lie flat. Um, but the decline in book binding quality um, came in the latter half of the 19th century and much of the 20th century. Um, these um, are affected by the poor quality paper and the boards that were used for book construction. Wooden book boards were replaced with various types of boards made from compressed paper pulp that became acidic over time. Many modern book cloths woven fabrics that contain pigments and sizes also um, are susceptible to fading easily and are vulnerable to attacks by insects and mold. Adhesives used in bindings are also unstable and sometimes different parts of the book respond to different changes of the environment causing distortion. Changes in the binding method also contributed to the decline of binding quality. Gradually, hand sewing of books decreased in favor for machine shop machine sewing books that are machine machine show over sewn rather than sewn through the fold do not open well they're very tight um and they don't lay flat um their pages also tear easily and be if they become brittle inexpensive case bindings in which the cover is prepared separately and then attached to the text block by gluing the end sheet to the case are less durable than traditional bindings. And then also uh, another type of binding that was used was perfect bindings. And these are still used today. Many of our paperbacks and um, modern books are made with this. Um, this is where um, the pages are attached to each other with adhesives rather than sewn. And these often fail. So they Often pages or entire sections may fall out. Um, then lastly, the reproduction methods that um, have come in late, beginning in the late 18th century, various reproduction methods began to replace hand copying of important documents in the late 19th century. Copying options for expanded and copying of original drawing, architectural drawings, plans, and maps became pop. Uh, became common objects produced using some of these copying processes which vary more quickly than others and they also may have multiple other questions that they're stored together um so it's very important when making storage and other preservation of uh, decisions for these materials a complete Review of co of all copying process is beyond the scope of this lesson, but a few of the most common are described here. So the litter copying process, um, we talked about this. Um, it was it was in, developed in the 18, 1780s and involved writing letters with a copying pencil and then pressing them into warm or into water dampened thin tissue with screw presses. This process became popular in the 1850s and then was later even used in the 1950s. The hectograph process, which became popular in the late 1800s, used aniline link, usually purple or blue, and then was used for copying both documents uh, and architectural drawings. Writing was transferred to a, a gelatin pad from which copies were made. Um, this is the same process for copying documents through mimeographs, photostat, or spirit duplicating. Um, many of these were not stable. Um, then blueprints came along in 1871. The process was used primarily to copy architectural drawings, plans, and maps. Um, the translucent, translucent material original was placed over sensitized paper containing iron salts and then exposed to light. After exposure, the original was removed and then the copy was washed to remove the exposed compounds under the lines of the original drawing. 
the result of the image was white lines on blue background. So blueprints are sensitive to alkaline environments and light exposure. Similar processes include Van Dyke prints. Um, those are sensitive to sulfur and other pollutants and often become brittle. And ferrogallic prints, those are alka, which are alkaline and light sensitive and can cause staining to adjacent prints. There's diazotypes. Um, these became popular in the 1920s. Um, and by the 1950s, it was used to copy office records as well as maps, drawings, and plans. A translucent original was placed on the paper coated with diazomine salts. This was exposed to ultraviolet light, which attacked the salts and turned the exposed areas off white. Depending on the specific types of compounds used on the paper, the lines of diazo prints can be various colors. Diazo prints are often processed with ammonia, which causes them to give off alkaline vapors, may, which may be harmful to other materials. Residual chemicals may also cause oxidation and discoloration of the print itself. Um, sepia prints are also a type of diazo prints, and they can have greasy stains or pink stains that can rub off on adjacent materials. They are also light sensitive. And then finally, electrostatic copying known as Xerox, Xerox graphy. Um, this technology was produced in the late 1940s and became popular in the 1960s. It makes a type a copy from original by forming an image with toner powder using electrostatic charge, fusing the image to the paper using a solvent, heat, or light. It is the most common copying process used today. Electrostatic copies are made from made on good quality paper and bonded well bonded to the paper. They are very stable, but um, if they're made on matte or transparent mylar, um, they are not permanent because the toner doesn't bond well to the mylar. So those are some inherent vices for paper and their structures. Um, there's many other things and just keep those few in mind um, and use those while making your preservation decisions. We will be discussing inherent vices for photographs. Photographs are composite objects consisting of a base, also called a support, a binder, and an image forming substance. To produce a photographic image, light sensitive materials such as silver salts are applied to a support material made of paper, cloth, plastic, or metal, and then is exposed to light. This forms either a direct visible image known as a printing out or a latent image, which can be then developed using a chemical developer as known as developing out. An image is fixed in order to remove ex excess light sensitive materials and to stop the darkening process. It is then washed to remove the residual fixer. So some things that may cause photographs to deteriorate on their own um, with their inherent vices are their binders. Um, the binder is made out of various materials. Um, and this is, the binder is actually what the image forming materials is suspended in. Um, so people have used alumin, which is an egg white based binder that tends towards chemical reactions that cause it to yellow over time, which is exacerbated by the presence of residual fixative and mounting on poor quality board. So you can see um, in some early photographs, um, they are starting to yellow because of the paper cardboard that they were put onto. Um, Alumin also becomes brittle and is subject to cracking. Uh, Collodion, um, a cellulose nitrate, is not flexible. And this also becomes brittle, leading to cracks in the emulsion but otherwise is fairly chemically stable and does not yellow. Um, another one is 
gum arabic, which is used as a binder for gum biochromate prints, which are stable but are very rare because they are difficult to produce. Gelatin is one of the most common binding materials. It is made from animal proteins. It is fairly stable chemical, chemically, but it is quite sensitive to moisture in the air. Um, so there's something that um, might in, introduce inherent vices into photographs from the support. So in the 19th century, prints generally had a primary support of high quality, stable paper. Although the secondary support was of poor quality, usually the board was used for very thin prints, such as alumen prints. In the late later 19th century, the primary paper support was often coated with a barium sulfate in gelatin or the colloidin um, for that type of printing out on paper. This was known as a variata layer. This layer was very stable and protected the paper from light damage and provided some protection against damaging substances from poor quality secondary supports. There's also resin coated um, paper which was actually polyethylene coated. This was introduced as a support for photographic prints during World War II and became commercially available during the 1970s. This type of paper shortened photographic processing time because it required less washing and it was sturdy, allowing the process to be complete, completely mechanized. Most modern color prints are printed on resin coated paper, which consists of a paper base between two layers of polyethylene with titanium dioxide added to the emulsion side of the layer. So the side that we see the image on. Many early prints on resin coated papers um, were framed and exhibited develop that they developed cracking of the emulsion layer over time. Some black and white resin coated prints on exhibit also developed redox, um, yellowing or silver mirroring and it's kind of you can see silver mirroring, it's like a, a reflection within the, it's a shimmery kind of coating on the, the, the photo itself. These problems were due to titanium dioxide in the emulsion, which facilitated the formation of oxidizing agents to, on exposure to light. And they occurred most commonly in frame photographs where the oxidizing agent could not dissipate. So getting trapped within a, um, a framed uh, support that wasn't good for the items. Stabilizers and antioxidants were added um, to the later resin coated papers during manufacturing to combat this type of deterioration, but this does not completely eliminate the risk of damage. Um, just like with other paper products, inks can also cause damage to the photograph depending on um, the types of binders and supports that were used in making the photograph. Here's a list of key environmental factors that place collections at risk. One example is light. Ultraviolet rays from natural and artificial sources can cause fading and disintegration. An example of this is if you have a photograph that is hanging on the wall and it might be exposed to light from a window or from a hallway um, and you can see some discoloration on parts of the, the photograph. Um, also, if you have a book with purple binding, um, the spine may become a brown color, and that just means that the ultraviolet rays are causing that spine to fade. Um, there are pollutants, so dust is abrasive and can accelerate harmful chemical reactions. So dust can help um, prolong or start up red rot, which is the decomposition of leather, 
Um, there's also a big issue with heat. High temperatures can accelerate the de uh, deteriora deteriorations as well. Um, high temperatures can also promote the, the growth of mold or um, crackling and brittleness. Moisture is another thing. High humidity promotes mold growth, corrosion, and degradation. While extensive dryness can cause drying and cracking, fluctuati fluctuations between extremes can also cause warping, buckling, and flaking. Pests are also another thing. So insects and creatures that feast on organic matter. So it's really a good thing to keep your materials not in locations where pests can get them. Um, and to also just dust um, and keep the area clean. Handling is also another um, thing that causes damage. Um, it causes damage to headbands, scratches, tears, abrasions, and just it, it wears out the items just even from normal use. Um, there's other things that we may not intentionally do to harm the items. Um, but lamination is one. Lamination is a permanent treatment that we have done to some materials that accelerates decomposition of those materials. Um, so these are things that we really should try and avoid um, and be mindful of when we're trying to preserve our materials. What should one look for when searching for an environment to store their materials? So we want to store materials in a stable environment. So a temperature that is below 70 degrees Fahrenheit and has a relative humidity of somewhere between 30 to 50 percent. Relative humidity is the amount of water vapor present in the air expressed as an percentage of the amount needed for saturation at the same temperature. So having a temperature of below 70 degrees Fahrenheit and having a relative humidity of that degree allows the materials to have a stable, safe environment that doesn't promote mold growth or dryness. Um, and so we really try and strive for that. We want to choose locations where these conditions are more apt to be found. So look for clean and climate controlled areas in the house. So choose closets, locations away from light, rooms with stable temperatures and humidities. Um, so try not to choose spaces with um, that are close to heaters or vents. Choose spaces that are off the floor. Um, don't put items in basements, attics, garages, barns, garden sheds, and storage units because those typically all have places, all have um, extreme temperatures, especially attics um, if they're not insulated or meant for um, folks, people to go into them. Um, and also just be sure to clean and dust regularly. If you really want to um, create a space for your materials, you really want to um, have a lower temperature of even 70. So 65 is kind of the ideal where um, people are not in that space for very long because it does get a little chilly and you still want that 30 to 50 percent relative humidity um, and you don't want too many fluctuations so you want plus or minus um, two degrees Fahrenheit and then three percent relative humidity up or down um, so you kind of want to go through that um, so while this is a targeted temperature temperature and relative humidity settings. This might be unrealistic for most people to do, um, but it's something that we can strive for. Um, and depending on how you like to keep your house, um, you might want to select a spot that you know might be a little bit cooler for your materials. There are basic concepts for preservation everyone can do. 
Um, one of those things is to wash and dry your hands before handling all materials. This is a really basic one and it helps with handling any materials. Um, please don't use lotions or hand sanitizers, um, oils from your hands, and then adding um, those types of products um, can cause grease stains um, and just cause general wear and um, increased deterioration of the materials. Use gloves when appropriate, um, especially when handling photographs, negatives, and films, and objects. Um, this will just help um, preserve that enam uh, the emulsion layer on photographs and um, keep our fingerprints off materials, um, or just help not to flake off maybe some part of the the photograph. Um, use pencils. Um, don't use ink pens or markers near materials that you want to preserve. Um, pencils are used um, throughout the archival and library world. Um, and when you're going to mark on a photograph, use a pencil with soft lead. Um, it will not leave the marks on the 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 photo side of the the photograph. Um, use book cradles, book snakes, book weights, or page turners when appropriate. The use of these book supports um, is dependent on if the materials are stable enough for that type of use. Some libraries, historical societies, and similar institutions have these items available for re the researchers to support material use, especially for items with stiff and fragile bindings. Um, and there are ways that individuals can make these types of book supports at their house. Um, do some research into what materials are best suitable for um, placing items on. Um, if it smells like plastic, do not use it. Um, but I believe someday in the future I'll do a, a program on how to make your own book weights. So if you're interested, stay tuned for that. Um, and then just knowing how to properly handle books and other items. Um, so particularly with opening a book, the binding or the book itself will tell you and um, how far it wants to be opened. So if the book is not opening very much, it has a really tight binding and that might be based on how it was made. If it was um, done in a library binding, it might have um, restricted access to it. Um, so try not to break the binding um, because that will just kind of increase its wear and it might not do so well after that. Um, do not fold or press down the pages. No dog ears. Um, so try not to do that. That will, might cause the parts of the pages to fall off. Um, and when you're using materials, try not to lean or write on top of the materials um, because that impression of your writing may transfer. Um, and then leaning on materials, if it's a soft graphite that was used in a letter or a drawing, that might rub off. Um, so those are just some basic concepts for preservation. Storing materials is one of the best ways to prolong the life of your materials. It is a good, cost-effective alternative to seeking conservation treatment. Here are some conservation basics for storing storage materials. We want to choose acid-free materials because we don't want the materials that we choose, such as folders, boxes, and envelopes, to leak acid into our materials that we are trying to protect and that might already be acidic themselves. Um, another option that we can choose from is buffered versus unbuffered. The buffered materials have calcium carbonate added into the paper product to make it non-acidic by giving it a pH of 8.5. So 
So when looking at using buffered or unbuffered materials, try and decide and identify the types of materials you want to store in those, those containers. Um, because if it's a photographic print that's made with a certain process, it may benefit from having unbuffered versus buffered material. Um, another option is using polyester or mylar or polypropylene plastic. Um, these plastics are suitable for preserving materials. They are stable. Um, one thing to look for when you are choosing um, envelope sleeves, um, things to put maybe photograph or, uh, photographs or research materials into, um, if they smell like plastics, do not use them. Um, one of the most notorious plastics that smell is polyvinyl acetate. Um, that's that traditional like smell like plastic. Then um, when selecting storage materials, choose them based on size and the quantity of items that you have. Um, so if you have one or two items, you don't want to have a whole big box to store them in. Um, but if you have multiples, you may need multiple sleeves and envelopes and of different sizes. And try and choose boxes where um, it's pretty form fitting to the item. So if you have an 8 by 10 set of photographs, um, you don't want to get a 11 by 15 box because they might slide around during moving and handling of those boxes. Also, be critical of materials that say that they are archival, that are sold from non reputable um, vendors. Uh, just because they might not be made to the standards of archival and library um, uses. Um, there are plenty of resources to learn what types of materials are best to use. A reputable vendor will also um, provide professional grade materials and they'll give a guidance as well. Um, if you have any questions, they'd be happy to answer your, your queries. Um, there's also a thing that you can do is the PAT, uh, Photographic Activity Test. This is routinely used to test papers, adhesives, inks, glass, and framing components, um, sleeving materials, labels, photo albums, scrapbooking supplies and embellishments, as well as other materials on request. So this test can be performed on products in development as well as materials already in use. So if this has a PAT test done on the item, then you can um, rest assured that it will be good to store your materials. Another type of way to store materials is through encapsulation. Um, so this is typically using mylar, as we described above the polyester. They come in sheets um, and then have also been welded into envelopes and things like that, but encapsulation is akin to lamination, but it's much better for the item. Encapsulation is just um, putting adhesive double-sided tape around the item, giving a border of at least two inches, um, and then giving a space in the two sheets so that air can flow through so it's not um, the buildup of the decomposition of the item does not deteriorate over time, and you can always remove the item from this type of enclosure. Um, so those are some basics for storage materials. Um, we'll be discussing some other types for photographic materials in the future. On this slide, we will be discussing how to properly store paper materials. We'll start off with bound materials. This includes books, um, bound volumes of newspapers, um, albums, large binders, those types of things. So one way to do this is through shelving. So when shelving books, you want to place appropriately sized books next to one another. So we can't, we wouldn't recommend that large books go by miniature books. So books that are, um, three inches and less, 
um, next to books that may be over a foot tall um, because they may damage each other, um, cause them, cause their structures to um, bend and morph into a shape that we don't want. Um, and the materials for shelving, so we want to look at what our shelves are made of. So if they are made of treated wood or metal, um, those depend on what, um, how much chemicals are leaching into our book. Um, so you don't want to have books next to um, really well lacquered uh, bookshelves because they might off gas onto the items themselves. Um, we want to shelve books upright um, or spine down if they're going to be um, on their sides. You don't want to place their text blocks down. Um, or if you want, if they have to be stored flat, um, they should be supported as well and not stacked any more than three, um, three volumes high, especially if they're large volu volumes. Um, and we want to use non-damaging or non-knifing bookends. So we want ones that will um, support the book but not um, damage the undersides of the books or cause them to become misshapen. Another way that we can store bound volumes or even um, loose letters and papers is through boxing. Um, so Choosing the appropriate box is always an important part of that. Um, if you have a set of letters um, throughout the decades, you can use folders to store them and then store them vertically. Um, just make sure that they're well supported um, and so they're not rolling over or um, causing to bend in some way. There's alternatives to boxing. Um, so if you have a book that has a dust jacket that you want to protect, you can use mylar or polyester dust jacket coverings. Um, you can also wrap those items up in undyed cotton or linen string with, with linen string or tape. Um, the tape isn't, um, with adhesive back. Um, it's just a thicker type of, um, material to wrap an item. Um, and those are good if you have an item that may be experiencing red rot. Um, these are ways to mitigate that transference to other materials um, and just keep things a little bit neater in your, um, your own library. There are pamphlets um, that may need some different types of enclosures. We can use phase, boxy, phase boxes. Uh, folders or special enclosures. So pamphlets can um, use envelopes, those types of things. Phase boxes can probably hold more than one um, pamphlet. And there's also pamphlets that can be sewn into other materials. So there's, uh, it's kind of like a desk check, uh, a book covering. Um, where you would remove the staples or the sewing of the pamphlet and then sew it into that other structure. And that will help keep the item. Um, but you wanna do this with materials that may not um, be of historical significance and may, that would be able to hand up, handle that type of um, conservation treatment as well. Um, so for documents, manuscripts, and ephemera, we suggest acid-free, linen-free, buffered file folders. And we don't, we would want to only have a maximum of, of about 15 sheets per folder. And these can then be placed into an archival box, all of the same size folders in there. Um, same with the bound materials, we want to store similarly sized folders and items together in boxes as well. For newsprint, after 1840, newsprints are very acidic and prone to turning yellow and brittle. Um, and so sometimes we can't save them from crumble, 
crumbling, um, even with a, a bath to remove some of the acid. Um, so sometimes it's just best to make photocopies or digitize or microfilm the materials for access. Um, but handling should be to the minimum, especially if it's starting to crumble on the edges and flake. Um, for frame materials, so if you want to have a photo out, um, an original, try and have it not be exposed to light or other materials, have it placed away from the glass frame so it doesn't get condensation and um, congeal the, the printing material. Um, but if you want to still have that image up but you don't care if it's the original, you can always make a photocopy and put that in there and then store the original in an envelope or a box or a folder and keep that safe. Um, so those are some basics for paper, ma paper material storage. Um, I hope this helps. On this slide, we'll be talking about photographs, how they're made, um, what types of things to look for, um, and then the different types of photographs through history that you may come across in your collection. Photographs are composite objects. They have a base, which is called a support. Um, a binder, and then an image forming substance. So there's many types of supports that you may run across. Um, people have printed photographs on paper, cloth, metal, or plastic, even glass, or other types of materials. Um, so just depending on the types of photographs you have may determine what you need to do for your preservation and how well they'll hold up over time. So daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, and tintypes, they are positive image, images captured on non-paper supports. So we may be really familiar with the daguerreotypes because they are from 1840s to 1860s. These are the first, first photographs, and they're typically found in small hinge cases and are quite fragile and subject to tarnishing due to exposure and pollutants. Um, then there's the ambrotypes, which came about in the 1850s, and tintypes. Those are smaller um, little plates with images on them. They may be hand colored, um, and those were produced through late 19th century. Um, so color and digital prints. A chromogenic, um, this is organic, most common and and the most common, and they use cyan, magenta, and yellow dyes, which was introduced in about 1935. There's non-chromogenic, um, which is non-organic. Azo dye is used and it is more stable. Um, this was introduced in 1955. Um, and then we have the digital color, which are, which is used in photo printers, and the stability depends on the ink and the support type. Um, so there's many different ways um, to create a photograph. Um, there's many books on how to identify them, um, and this is just a brief overview. But if you have more questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Here are some basics for storing photographic materials. Photographs are best stored in, in individual enclosures of either paper or plastic. Some reasons to choose one or the other, paper can protect from light and buildup of moisture and gases from inside the enclosure, but they do require more handling as the object must be removed from the enclosure for examination, but it is a cheaper and easier um, material to use. Um, it can be written on, whereas plastic enclosures is a little bit harder to do. But um, some papers can abrade the photograph during its insertion and removal from the enclosure. So depending on how um, tight the enclosure is around the photograph, it might cause some unseen damage. Um, the reasons to choose plastics is that it does allow the viewer to um, 
see the image through through the container itself without handling. Um, but plastics can trap gases, and once you're in, within the enclosure, it can be difficult to write on and sometimes flimsy. And it can um, usually have they usually have heat sealed seams, which um, those eliminate the potential of damage from adhesive seams. So like we talked about earlier uh, about encapsulation, there's different types of encapsulation, the heat sealed or the adhesive sealed. And so it just depends on which one you choose. Um, the paper or plastic enclosure can be envelopes, sleeves, or folders. Um, if you are boxing the material, the photos should be stored flat, and if they are stored vertically, they should be well supported, just because you don't want them to fold or buckle um, under the weight of other ones. And so those are some basics for storing photographic materials. Here are some fast facts about preservation for your knowledge. More than 4.8 billion artifacts are held in public trust, by more than 30,000 archives, historical societies, libraries, museums, his scientific research collections, and archaeological repositories in the United States. 1.3 billion of these items are at risk of being lost. Roughly 70% of institutions need additional conservation or preservation training for their staff or volunteers. A majority of collecting institutions, more than 80%, do not have a disaster plan in place that can be executed by trained staff. This is really important when we have unexpected weather disasters, um, such as flooding, fires, and things like that. Um, to have something in place where, or even just a water, a water leak, um, just how to kind of take care of those items during this emergency. Um, nearly a quarter of all 21 million sculptures and works of art um, in the United States need some sort of conservation treatment or improved care and conditions. More than 50% of collecting institutions have had their collections damaged by light. More than 65% of collecting institutions report damage to their collections due to improper storage. These are just some things that we should be aware of, especially within our own collections. Um, how much light materials are being exposed to, um, the fluctuations of temperatures and humidities um, that may cause damage that we might not see um, readily apparent, uh, at least not until over time that we can examine it. Um, so this is why preservation is so important for um, libraries and archives, but also for individuals. So we are done talking about how to preserve your materials. Um, but one question you may have is where to purchase these materials to store and care for your items. There are several companies that are available for um, purchasing archival materials, and they are Gaylord, University Products, Hollinger, and broad art and there's also local companies such as archival products based in des moines there's a national one in new york called talus each one of these companies provides different services at different prices um, so kind of look at these different places and what fits into your budget and what fits into your needs for preservation um, but they all have good products and they've they've been used by libraries and archives and museums to store their materials. Another question you may have is where can I find an appraiser? Many booksellers perform appraisals as a part of their business. The Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America has a membership directory on its website that allows you to search for qualified booksellers in a geographical region or by their fields of specialty. So if you have a modern first edition that you want to have them look at, you can find a dealer who does deals within those specifications. 
Your local Yellow Pages directory may also contain names of used, rare, or antiquarian booksellers in your area. Because of the range of rare books is vast, you should seek an appraiser who is knowledgeable in, a, in your particular area um, and the types of books that you have. Ask for references and referrals until you are satisfied that you have found the right person. Other sources for finding appraisers include the Appraisers Association of America and, and, and the International Society of Appraisers. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation on preserving family heirlooms. If you have any questions or would like to talk to us about preservation concerns, please email us at specialcollections at davenportlibrary.com or call us at 563-326-7902. If you want to follow us on our social media, we have three different ways to do that. We have an Instagram, Facebook, and we have a blog. Each one of those have different content that we share. We share pictures of our collections, things that we're doing, and share also different resources that are available to you. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation today. Have a great day.